right. Can you see that okay? Looks great, Donna. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Eggleston. And as um, as introduced, I'm Donna Hefner. I am the president and CEO of CRV Medical Center, and I have been with my organization uh, 33 years. I uh, have been the CEO for the last 11 years, and uh, as a result of that, uh, most of my uh, experience in the acute care setting has been as a registered nurse working the clinical side and then moved into a, a leadership role um, and served in various leadership roles from nursing to ancillary to now uh, senior leadership. So um, I, um, as Dr. Eggleston said, I have the privilege of working with him as a consultant uh, to my research dissertation. And, and so the title of our topic today is the relationship of exclusive breastfeeding rates and organizational characteristics and newborn type of delivery in hospitals in California. So as we as we look at forward at this topic, um, breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding rates in, in hospitals in California, it's been very challenging. And so one thing that we know that uh, breastfeeding does have positive health related effects for the, both the mother and the child. And those can be anywhere from um, helping reduce uh, otitis media, ear infections in children, to actually helping reduce mortality in mothers. And that, that is shown in the research and you'll, you'll see that as well. But really, you know, in this topic and background, the organizational characteristics, um, such as, as you'll see in some of the variables and its relationship to this uh, quality outcome, um, is, is there a correlation? Um, but we do see that there's a lack of congruence in the state and national uh, and international quality initiatives. And as I, I referenced here, you know, the, the World Health Organization has had a goal um, to help improve exclusive breastfeeding rates by 50% by 2025 uh, for the first six months of life of the child. So where it really all begins is in hospitals. So how can hospitals help um, with this um, public health initiative? And so as newborn delivery practices and rates of exclusive breastfeeding um, have far uh, been below what the rates that have been expected in the state of California, this has been a, a journey. And so the increased focus here is to understand how these organizational characteristics in hospitals throughout California can help um, the primaparous mothers and the multiparous women to increase uh, the exclusive breastfeeding rates. And I, I will note, you know, as we uh, start to look at um, the hospitals in California, there's been a significant reduction in hospital closures of um, perinatal bay beds over the last three years. And so um, specifically, we've seen 30 uh, perinatal, um, 30 hospitals close their obstetric units. So very significant, um, more and more pressure on those hospitals that are offering these services. So let's dive into... Um, a little bit of background. So as researchers have previously attempted to evaluate these factors related to the first hour of a mom's giving birth, um, they recommend in maternity units that the patient-centered practices uh, will help increase breastfeeding rates, um, but delivery rooms have um, are unique environments um, for instituting quality initiatives and and the necessitate precise examination of how state level collaboratives lead positive impacts. So uh, we'll talk about a little bit what those quality initiatives could be, but as healthcare leader um, who support organizational practices such as myself, um, we can influence um, these quality initiatives. And so um, we wanna, our goal here is to increase breastfeeding rates and move towards these state and national benchmarking um, for the outcomes of moms and babies uh, in California. So the problem of the research is informing that there's a lack of knowledge regarding the relationship between organizational characteristics of the hospitals, and that's the hospital size, um, the so, and that could be the number of beds, um, baby-friendly, uh, designation, the community population, as, as Dr. Eggleston mentioned, and the type of economic sector, for-profit, not-for-profit, governmental or county um, entities, and the newborn delivery type, um, as moms deliver either vaginally or cesarean, and then exclusive breastfeeding rates in hospitals in California, the state of California. So 
As we look to, at the purpose, this will be a quantitative correlation study to explore those relationships between the organizational characteristics um, of the hospital size and, and number of beds, the baby friendly in the community population. Um, and that will include um, ethnicities uh, and the type of economic se sector. And that'll be um, through the mediated through the, the newborn delivery type and to look at the outcome. So the framework draws on these three major themes. Uh, it's uh, the, the themes that are supporting this research is the self-efficacy theory, uh, the theory of planned behavior and the social cognitive theory. And by incorporating the proposed theoretical framework, this gives us a comprehensive lens to look and examine how the influence of organizational characteristics um, and type of newborn delivery and, uh, and rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals. The research model uh, here is, as I've been mentioning, the economic sector, the hospital size, so uh, including the number of FTEs um, as si at, across California, Hospitals vary in, in various sizes um, of number of beds from very small critical access hospital, which can be less than 20 beds um, to acute care beds to large academic medical centers, which are oh, sometimes upward of five to 600 beds. And then the baby friendly designation is, is um, standards that really help support this initiative, but not all hospitals are required to um, obtain this designation. In my in the organization I serve, uh, it takes several years to obtain this designation. And we are the first and only hospital in, in the Central Valley um, that has this designation. And as, as we mentioned, the, the population here, 65% of our community is insured by Medi-Cal. So they are challenged economically to be able to, you know, afford um, the, the nutritional uh, needs for infants, and they do get uh, support from state subsidy programs. Um, some of the things that we're also looking at is in the community is, is the percentage of His Hispanics. And in my community, uh, we have over 65% uh, of our population is Hispanic, very agriculture dense community. And um, one will also look at our percentage of black and white uh, in the population. Um, because some of the th research that we know, we'll talk about that, is around um, some of the, the diverse inclusion issues. And then these variables uh, will be mediated through the delivery uh, of vaginal cesarean um, and to look at the exclusive breastfeeding rates. So the research questions and hypothesis uh, here uh, are two research questions. To what extent do the organizational characteristics, such as hospital size and bed numbers, baby friendly, um, as you can see, community population and economic sector correlate with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals in California? So the null, hypo the null hypothesis would be that the organizational characteristics, when mediated by the type of birthing delivery, do not positively correlate with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals. And the alternative is that the organizational characteristics when mediated by the type of delivery, birth delivery positive correlates with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding. And the theory that supports this research question are the same that I presented before. Um, the second question here is to what extent does the type of newborn delivery correlate with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals? So the null hypothesis would be that the type of newborn delivery does not positively correlate with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding. And the alternative will be that the new type of newborn delivery does positively correlate with the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals in California, also supported by our three theories. So key, key terms, um, I won't cover them in detail, but um, we felt that was important just to list here the delivery type, exclusive breastfeeding, uh, multi-parous women is a woman that delivers at least one newborn child. So uh, obviously wanted to look at uh, that population. And then here, the definition of planned behavior and postpartum well-being and primaparous women, and then the self-efficacy representing the determinant, uh, consistently recognizing a shape by earlier and recent breastfeeding experience. 
The literature review uh, incorporate incorporates exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals. So we look at the importance of uh, exclusive breastfeeding. I looked at factors influencing the implementation of exclusive breastfeeding and then newborn type of delivery uh, and exclusive breastfeeding. And then looking obviously at the, the benefits um, of the exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals and what the health outcomes at hospitals with um, exclusive breastfeeding policies uh, could look like for the literature review. So here, um, the importance of exclusive breastfeeding in the hospitals, according to Kantu, is that it, breastfeeding is associated with a range of improvements to the health of our children. Uh, as Grundy explains, that this is the most natural um, way of providing nutrition. It's perfectly tailored, like it could, it, it changes over time. So it's like the right nutrition for the age of the infant um, based on the biological and evolution uh, to meet the infant's needs. And, and I think that's just a, a note in the research um, that makes this very important. When we look at the importance of breastfeeding in hospitals specifically, that it's so important for infants that they, even during the pandemic, that there was the risk of not breastfeeding, um, you know, was considered. So it the risk outweighed um, the the contract of the virus to through the mother's breast milk, and we found that not to be true. But that was very much a consideration. But as modern life um, lends itself to this hectic pace that we all lead, and and many mothers may opt out for formula instead of breastfeeding due to perceived ease and convenience. But through the literature, we do know that if we can support the mother in the first 48 hours, they're gonna be more likely to continue to breastfeed to up to the six months. So factors influencing implementation, um, according to Michaela, new mother's attitude uh, regarding breastfeeding can improve in response to hospital-based initiatives that focus on supporting this experience. So as you can see in the illustration below, um, it, healthcare professionals' attitudes within the hospital may uh, be antecedent to the new mother's attitudes, such as new mothers may tend to value exclusive breastfeeding less insofar as professionals themselves do not seem fully committed. So this is very important uh, in recognizing the professional's attitudes uh, and how that translates into new mothers, um, also breastfeeding attitudes. So interventions can be also improve healthcare professionals' own attitudes and uh, through awareness and education. And as we talk about newborn type of delivery, uh, the vaginal cesarean, uh, prior research uh, delineates that there is a relation, potential relationship between that type of delivery. And then also these initiatives um, for exclusive breastfeeding by focusing on a retrospective group, pre and post intervention design using couplets of mothers and healthy newborns also showed a correlation that these, those that were born by cesarean were less likely to be exclusively breastfed. And some of that, those challenges are due to the recovery of the mother. And so um, in this uh, research article, Hussein uh, in 2019 examined the exclusive uh, breastfeeding uh, among uh, located in Tanzania, indicated that the factors related to delivery type um, impacted the exclusive breastfeeding rates. And these interviews of three, 430 mothers showed that women delivered by cesarean were less likely to receive instantaneous uh, education. And as a result, um, the method reduced their likelihood to be able to breastfeed um, and the education was less. So when we look at the health out healthcare outcomes for patients at hospitals and, the, and with breastfeeding policies, um, the researcher uh, von C. Hausen, for example, conducted research uh, on the influence of baby-friendly health initiative on the uptake uh, of breastfeeding among new mothers, and they found that the initiative was effective in this regard. So quite simply, this, the outcomes of these policies are identical to the outcomes of the, uh, breastfeeding itself. And so that's illustrated here in the, in the figure of body of evidence uh, through the premise of exclusive breastfeeding is equal to good in research on effective uh, policies. And the literature does not address the positive effects of exclusive, best, um, exclusive breastfeeding policies, but 
but does support promoting the practice. So tying this together by incorporating the self-efficacy theory, the theory of planned behavior and social cognitive, the proposed framework, again, provides that comprehensive framework to uh, look at the influence of organizational characteristics, the type of newborn delivery, the rate of exclusive breastfeeding in the hospitals, and then the complex interplay between the individual's beliefs and social norms and organizational factors, providing a holistic understanding in the dynamics of this healthcare administration topic. So self-efficacy uh, developed by Bandura in 1979 um, poised the individual's beliefs and their ability to perform specific behaviors, influence their motivation and their actions and subsequent outcomes. And so a higher self-efficacy uh, lends more likely engaged in the behavior and preserve, um, pre persevere in the facing challenges. And healthcare professionals um, with higher self-efficacy support more effective behaviors in promoting this as well. So organizational characteristics, such as the presence of supportive policies, resources, training programs, administrators, uh, influence healthcare professionals' self-efficacy and consequently their behaviors and practice um, related to those uh, quality initiatives. So our theory of planned behavior um, proposed by a Agent 1991 centers around the idea that individuals' intentions to perform a behavior are influenced by their attitudes and subjective norms and perceived uh, behavior control. So healthcare professionals' attitudes towards exclusive breastfeeding and their perceptions of social norms and expectations may influence, influence their intentions and subsequent actions. So here, organizational characteristics such as leadership can support a positive culture and can shape the factors that impact healthcare professionals' intentions and behaviors related to exclusive breastfeeding. And then social cognitive theory, also developed by Bandera in 1978, emphasized the reciprocal interaction between individuals and their environments and their behaviors. So social cognitive theory suggests that healthcare professionals' observations of of and interactions with colleagues who support and practice exclusive breastfeeding can influence the confidence and knowledge and therefore individuals and organizational factors such as self-efficacy beliefs and organizational norms and available resources can impact the healthcare professionals adoption and maintenance of exclusive breastfeeding practices. In chapter three, um, in the proposed dissertation, uh, utilizations quantitative correlation research methodology to investigate the relationship between the organizational characteristics and type of newborn delivery and rate of exclusive breastfeeding in hospitals in California. And this quantitative approach will support the systematic examination of the association and correlation, not causation, um, between the variables and enabling the research or myself to assess the extent of that relationship. And then uh, the proposed research will not include human subjects. Um, the population is uh, it predominantly exclusively California hospitals that perform live births. And it is like you can see in my uh, sample size, I used a G power calculation with the 13 variables. So my sample size will be 190. And uh, when the power correlation is at a 0 0.80 with a P value of less than 0 0.05. And then my data source um, is coming from a public website and it's from the California Health and Human Services. It's an open portal and uh, it will, it's download, it will be downloaded from the data set uh, to make an original data set for research question one and two, and then um, hospital characteristics for the California providers under research question one and two. And you can see the end value and then the, the site, the data set where it's downloaded from. And the data collection uh, does not require an instrument. Um, it's secondary data use and for this proposed study and all secondary data set used to develop an original data set for the project will be provided by this uh, California Public uh, Department of Public Health. And the internal validity is key consideration and ensured careful selection and, and definition of the variables of interest and the reliability will be established through the utilization and standardized secondary data collection. Uh, this is uh, data that these hospitals publicly report. As the researcher, I'll ensure the data set is de-identified and handled with strict confidentiality following the established protocols, uh, relevant legal and regulatory requirements. 
I'll store the data in on an encrypted USB drive and secure it and keep it in a lock file for five years following the conclusion of the, the research. And the USB drive will be wiped of all data and destroyed after five years. And the data analysis uh, begins with preparation of the data, um, development of the spreadsheet of, through and import it into the Excel uh, 2023 to prepare and clean the data file. And then any personal data will be removed um, and then review the spreadsheet, determine if items are not necessary or uh, for analysis or be removed if there's no data. And then data uh, then will be exported into SPSS version for outlier analysis and subsequent analysis concerning descriptive statistics and hypothesis testing. And the data will be examined for outliers and cases will be removed from the data set prior to analysis. And then analysis will begin with descriptive statistics. And then as assumptions, um, as the researcher assumes that there's sufficient amount of data available at hospital level uh, in California to conduct a comprehensive analysis, and the assumptions is based on the expectations that hospitals routinely collect and report this data on organizational characteristics, type of newborn delivery, and exclusive breastfeeding rates, and then assumes the hospitals in California have implemented breastfeeding support programs, policies aimed to promote exclusive breastfeeding. And the limitation is secondary data poses limitations um, since as the researcher has limited control over the data collection process, the correlation research designed employed uh, in the study limits the establishment of causal relationship. And another limitation is the study focuses on hospitals in California and may limit the generality of the findings to other geographical regions with different healthcare systems, cultural norms, and social economic characteristics. Uh, delimitations uh, delimited the scope of the analysis of organizational characteristics, uh, as you can see here, of those hospitals located in specifically California, and delimits the data collection to secondary data gathered at the hospital level, and the, de the delimitation is necessary to ensure the feasibility and completion of the study is within the given time constraints. The reliability, uh, to establish reliability, the study utilizes, utilizes the secondary data, as I mentioned, and has undergone standardized data collection process. And then the internal validity of the study will carefully define in the variables of interest and namely organizational characteristics and the type of newborn delivery, as you can see here. Um, the ethical considerations. Uh, here, the concerns is no direct interaction with individuals. Uh, ethical considerations are still critical to ensure the responsible use of the existing data. And informed consent uh, from individuals is not required as this is a secondary data set. Uh, the data set will be de-identified and handled with st strict confidentiality. And then the privacy and anonymity of the individuals whose information is included in the secondary data will be protected and the researcher will provide a clear and unbiased interpretation of the findings and ensure the reporting and dissemination of the results are conducted in an ethical manner. And with that, that brings me to the end of my chapter three, and I am open for any questions that you may have for me. Right, Donna, well, I appreciate it. I'm gonna start off here. I mean, it's interesting seeing the proposal and help you kind of developed the study. And I know you had a chance to access the data. And I'm curious, kind of like, I know you're in the process of analyzing the data here. So you don't have, well, quite yet have the results yet, but I was curious about what you hope to learn or what you think you'll you'll learn as you look at uh, some of the some of the information in the this data, data that's already available. What, what, what are you expecting to kind of find out here uh, regarding uh, what the data provides for you? Or, and potentially, what are some of the limitations you think in the data in terms of maybe has only data been collected for a limited period of time on this topic and especially related to incentives? So, yes. well, thank you uh, for the question. And let me specifically talk about the incentives, which is really more new and upcoming um, and, and so new that I wasn't able to put that into the research. Um, but hospitals are now. Um, as this public health initiative and the California Maternal 
It's a quality care collaboration, um, have been working together. There is a quality of incentive program similar to Medicare value-based purchasing. Years ago, um, CMS has implemented those hospitals that actually meet quality uh, outcomes. They actually get to keep their financial revenue uh, for taking care of a patient that is insured by Medicare. So those uh, are limited to like heart attack, congestive heart failure, um, there's several pneumonia. And so um, this public data is, so hospitals are compared with um, among other hospitals based on their outcomes. So similar, this uh, exclusive breastfeeding is becoming a quality initiative. The Joint Commission, as well as the state of California are recognizing hospitals and helping us be incentivized to take this initiative on um, do, and, and actually help improve the quality um, outcomes. So um, what I'm hoping to understand here is there's not been a lot of, in the literature review, there was not a lot of research around um, this structure of looking at hospitals, but what we know based on the first um, mothers that deliver, regardless if it's vaginal or cesarean, they're going to stay in an acute care anywhere from 24 hours to more like 72 hours. So um, there's the golden, this is an opportunity um, to really influence and help teach and guide um, so what I'm hoping to learn from this is that is there a correlation among hospitals in California looking at the, you know, the economic sector and seeing if, if based on, you know, a for-profit, not-for-profit, do they have a correlation with higher or lower exclusive breastfeeding rates? So as I was going through chapter three, I think you could probably hear me uh, kind of going between downloading. So I have been, uh, as Dr. Eggleston said, been uh, downloading my data set. And, um, and, and what I'm finding is that there is a defined period of time where based on the uh, community population of uh, Hispanic, African American, and Caucasian, there is very limit. There's very limited uh, uh, data related to that um, to that exclusive breastfeeding rates. So we're we're starting to see some of the data come through, but um, I think we're going. I'm going to be able to uh, in my chapter four and five be able to have an interesting um, conclusion. Right. Other questions from some of our attendees today for the Inter Interprofessional Education Committee. Yeah, hi. This is uh, Ricardo Parker. Um, Donna, great presentation. I have a, uh, one question about uh, your collection of data with regards to the breakdown of your uh, population. I think you identified Blacks, Hispanics, and White. Any preliminary information about uh, the breakdown of, on those numbers? And just to throw this in, I know UCLA is also uh, is doing a similar study looking at breastfeeding. Uh, I believe the focus has been on is with uh, uh, on African American women uh, mm -hmm. frequency of breastfeeding. I don't know whether it's uh, in the uh, area of um, whether uh, well for newborns or whatever. But um, with that being said, what what's your breakdown uh, for? Uh, the ethnic groups in your study? Yes. I, I initially you know, had focused uh, my community on Hispanic uh, and and then just all. Um, and as um, I was getting into it, there was recommendation to expand that. And as we know, African-American uh, women um, have a higher rate of mortality um, than any other population. And so as I'm bringing uh, in the uh, number of individuals that deliver based on ethnicity in the various organizations, it, it it's um, of the hundred and, and there's actually two, it started out with 250 hospitals um, that deliver, have perinatal beds. And then from there, um, when you start looking at the breakdown of the community of the ethnicity it's um very it's very confined to like areas like you talk about UCLA Alameda 
um, health system up in Northern California. But when you're talking about some of the rural areas, um, you know, like, for example, Sierra View, uh, you know, our denominator there was uh, of African American deliveries was five in a year. So um, I think we're going to learn. A, I'm going to learn a lot um, based on organizations and just maybe what the differences are there and how that correlates with the outcome. But the benefits to mom and baby, um, especially with the African-American population, uh, the research shows there's significant benefits. And so I, I'm hoping that this research will um, be informative to all California hospitals that they will find. Um, because at the, up to this point, it's been like um, not... It, it's either one of those initiatives that you have a passion for and you support it from a leadership standpoint, or you it's just something that's, you know, a give or take, right? So now that we're starting to see more evidence, there's more um, quality incentive initiatives where I think that's going to change a lot in the next couple of years. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Parker. Yes. Other questions from any attendees on any of the research? I just uh, wanted to thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, when do you? When did you say you expect to have all your results, and how will you present them again? Yes, I'm hoping to be done here in the by May, um, and if if Dr. Eccleston would have me back, I'd love to just take a few minutes of your time and share, but or disseminate after I'm done. Um, you know, with my final defense, but I should be done uh, in May. Yes, please. We would like to hear the results of your research. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. And, you know, Dr. Eggleston has been so kind. As I mentioned, nursing me in my background, um, you know, I, I was the leader that uh, supported the baby friendly initiative in our organization. And obviously the funding didn't come from anywhere, but internally based on our own um, revenues. So um, I think we're going to see other additional sources of funding, maybe in the future that can help um, offset some of the costs that it takes to, um, to actually become a baby friendly designated hospital. So. I could talk a long time on this subject just because I'm passionate about it. Not that I have complete oversight of the program. Okay. Well, you definitely picked the right topic to do research because I think all of us here who have some experience working in research. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I always tell my students when, uh, you know, you stay in school long enough, you can actually study things you're interested in and actually make a living uh, doing it. So it's, it's great that you're passionate about the topic and it is amazing uh, all the new research that's being done uh, and then uh, I don't know, I think it'll be almost interesting to see the research of like what happened, you know, why did people go away from breastfeeding and was there, you know, potentially even a, a marketing strategy by uh, uh, the uh, maybe uh, formula makers, uh, per perhaps, I don't know exactly, uh, not trying to go into conspiracy theories or things like that, but considering the, the value and the benefits, now, I do know, obviously, some women have challenges, uh, you know, in terms of uh producing milk as well as their schedules and things like that so there's a a placeful formula and so forth but it is a it is amazing uh how kind of there was a shift that happened in society so yes and and you're you're right i thought about that a lot too um being in a very uh poor community uh and so that women are really supported through the WIC program that that was the motivator to why they wouldn't breastfeed. But since, you know, just my observation, um, that hasn't been a, a big driver. Um, they're really, it's just around the self-efficacy of feeling that they can do it and they're supported by an education program and, and people are there to help them. And I, I think there's, there's a lot to gain even further down the road on research around this as well. Yeah, I, uh, Ricardo part here again. Yeah, I, I, I was actually going to make a comment about that. Uh, uh, one thing that's kind, of, that's kind of interesting is uh, when you're looking at uh, the different hospitals um, that you're, that you're studying, like nonprofit versus for-profit versus, say, government or community hospitals, and the representation of those populations in those centers. 
Uh, any preliminary uh, data you can share or uh, observations you can share about that with regards to um, who they are and whether or not uh, I'll say those that are well resourced versus those that are not well resourced and whether there's a uh, demarcation between uh, who's actually breastfeeding and who's not. I, I had actually included that in the my initial research, uh, and that was research number three. Um, but I had to it got uh, it it got refined, so um, I was not able to incorporate that. But I do I do think that would be a further study that I would love to know more about or about the financial performance of organizations. And to your point, I feel like um, yes, I would. Wish I had, I was hoping to have more of this done for you, um, but I'd love to share when I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, well, that, that would be great. You know, uh, maybe you got later on in the year, especially if you had a chance to finish this up and maybe even to uh, work on uh, disseminating further uh, in terms of maybe look at uh, writing up an article after you finish uh, your, your study with your uh, degree here. That'd be outstanding here, uh, as well as maybe a nice way to bookend uh, some of our speakers in uh, the year. So maybe uh, later on in the year here. Any other questions from any of our attendees tonight on Donna's presentation on some of the benefits of breastfeeding? Some of the research she's conducted, at least especially in a, she did a nice extensive literature review of what's been known on the topic, especially for the state of California. Hi, I just have a quick question um i'm my i'm kerwin i'm i'm from brooklyn um okay. in your research did you is there like a time period that breastfeeding is beneficial to both pit both the mother and the the infant and and just a quick comment before i finish um even though in healthcare and i work for a non-for-profit hospital um in brooklyn I've seen um, in terms of healthcare encourage mothers to breastfeed while they're in the hospital. But then on the other side, you know, there is this stigma of breastfeeding um, in public, which sort of impacts the way um, women breastfeed now. So it's easier to, it's convenient to use other resources like the pump to feed kids as opposed to, to breastfeeding. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important comment um, in regards uh, to what we're seeing in some of the social norms um, now with these younger mothers uh, around the expression of milk and working moms. And um, so, yes, yeah, so to your question, could you read? I was really going down the path of, you know, just the setting in Brooklyn. Um, could you repeat your question, Kerwin, for me? Oh, no, I was just wondering if there is a time period where breastfeeding is beneficial to both the mother and the kid, if, if you saw that in your research. Um, I know in the hospital, um, mothers are there for like 24, 72 hours for the most. Um, is it just beneficial for that time period? Or maybe in your research, did you know it uh, six months, three months, it, it's, it's more beneficial? official to the mother and the kid? Yes. So it's a really good question. So um, the research shows, and, and there's many, many studies that shows that to try to reach the, the ultimate goal is for six months. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, has set this as the new standard. It used to be three months uh, as their initial goal. And so um, when, so the 72 hours or the 48 hours that the mom is in acute care, the the golden hour, the first hour is called the golden hour. And that's where under the initiatives you do, you got to get uh, skin to skin with mom and baby. Um, that will increase the likelihood of the mom being successful um, with breastfeeding. But other things come into play in those first few um, days of life. Um, because of the mom's milk not coming in, the mom sometimes has a perception that they are not have enough to feed their infant. And so uh, one of the other additional research thing the, uh, in the literature review we're seeing is that 
um, programs such as the human donor breast milk in a well baby postpartum unit can help the mom be successful um, in reaching that six month goal um, if they are supported uh, with human donor breast milk. And so there are many uh, ways in which organizations have um, been able to get approval from California Department of Public Health as a, it's like a donor. Um, so there's there's a, um, a for, there's a process you have to go through to obtain that. Um, and so um, there's various, um, so in human donor breast milk, uh, we had, we've used what they call NIQ and it's a high pressurized powder form that is reconstituted. It sits on a shelf longer. It's not, um, have to be refrigerated. And so, um, that helps support moms to, uh, in that first 72 hours to correlate with the literature to help them. Where we find in these social norms is that they need that lactation support, um, through lactation specialist, um, when they go home. It is in with the first couple weeks of life that they find themselves going to something that is safer or easier for them. And, um, and so when they start to experience those challenges, they need to be, uh, in a support group and get that extending, uh, education to get over the second, uh, challenging point in their, um, in, in that, in that journey. So, yeah, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of evidence, uh, and research around all, all of that, but, um, this small portion that we play in hospitals, I think can really, um, start to change this public health, uh, movement, uh, and help people be healthier. I think down the road, I think, um, our community is going to be healthier if, once we reach this goal. And I will share one statistic. So in 2013, when I became CEO, we were not baby friendly. Our baby friend, uh, our exclusive breastfeeding rates were 30%. And 10 years later in 2023, uh, we were only still at 51% when the goal is to, to be at um, 80%. So we're still falling short um, in just this journey, but I think we're going to learn how other hospitals are doing as well. All right. Well, I really appreciate that uh, question. That, I think that was really interesting to see kind of what the progress is. And I think uh, it was a good comment, Kerwin, uh, definitely about the stigma and the social norms and trying to change that. And, you know, I think you know, I'd be interested to see almost a historical piece about uh, what might happen. And I think there's a lot of kind of uh, uh, think sexism, I think, against women, especially once women uh, enter the workforce and were competing. Uh, there was definitely a lot of... Uh, uh, not lack of support for women uh, to be able to breastfeed, for example, in the workplace and in public places and then so forth. It was kind of like they had to make a decision uh, either to have a stay home and have a child or to have a career. So I think that's a great point and uh, one that hopefully will continue to support changing norms uh, to make it easier and more supportive uh, for women uh, to breastfeed uh, and really decrease that, that stigma. So, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great point. And we, we, uh, Sean makes a great comment in the chat that we are recording these webinars and then we are uploading them onto YouTube. So it is it is really great. I, I know I actually, I have been listening to uh, a lot, kind of our last couple ones. Uh, I'm a little bit of a geek, but I like to have something on the background when I'm doing a little bit of work. And so I will put on different uh, webinars and things like that to, to kind of listen to. And I uh, it, it's just kind of nice to have something on the background and maybe constructive and to think about conversations and topics. So uh, we, we will be sharing that after uh, the, the recording here. And I think it's definitely a great idea to maybe kind of uh, bring Donna back once she's able to kind of finish up her analysis of her results to kind of see uh, what the next steps are, um, especially because they're really supporting, supporting the health of a, of a mother and a, of an infant it seems kind of like a no-brainer in terms of what we should be doing in our society and definitely in the field of, of public health and healthcare in general. It should be something that we should uh, obviously, you know, I think be able to say in unison uh, to be able to support uh, the health of a uh, health of a mother and obviously the health of a, a new infant uh, child. So should, shouldn't be necessarily political here. <laughs> obviously, right. Support, uh, support it for health. Uh, but it, it is challenging in the United States to, with uh, the complexity of our healthcare system, uh, the mix of public and private and so forth. That's probably the biggest challenge and why we have uh, some of our disparities, especially related to things such as uh, infant mortality. So, 
uh, as a, <laughs> infant mortality rates being higher uh, for a high income country. Continue. In, in California, we as in hospitals are obligated to have um, lactation available rooms for our employees. But 10 years ago, we didn't have that. And that's one of the most, um, I, I would say one of the most challenging issues I had faced initially was be um, not having them. And then where do you actually be able to provide a hand washing station and a refrigerator and all the, there's a many elements that go into that. But I think, you know, in, in our agriculture community, when women are out picking fruits and vegetables, there's not those accommodations. So it's not a one size fits all for employers. And, and I think those are just another one of those challenging norms that, you know, that Kerwin, you know, mentions, you know, in regards to some of the, um, you know, things, the issues that we're trying to overcome. So I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think so. And also to just our audience, if you have any ideas or speakers uh, for upcoming meetings, we are definitely open to suggestions. I'm looking for speakers for upcoming meetings. Um, like definitely like to have Donna back later on this year. But if you have any suggestions, please email me, uh, Brandon Eggleston, uh, the Eggleston at nu.edu. Uh, if you have any questions, you can find me in the National University uh, directory here uh, because I'm definitely open to finding other presenters for our interprofessional education uh, speaker series for the School of Health Professions. Uh, definitely excited to have that. I know I enjoy uh, an opportunity to learn and maybe put down maybe some of the work I'm doing and get a chance to kind of learn a little bit. I enjoy this format too. And uh, just kind of like when I get a chance to read an art, a research article for, for interest as opposed to just uh, maybe out of uh, to help a student or anything like that, or for prepare a class or something like that. So uh, if you have any suggestions for speakers, let me know. Otherwise, any other final questions for Donna as we finish up on this Thursday evening? All right. Well, again, I want to appreciate everyone. And for those of you who do celebrate, celebrate the religious holiday this weekend, I wish you a good holiday weekend. For those of you at National University taking some time off next week, I know it is a week we don't have classes. So I know our dean has encouraged us to take some of our leave time next week. I wish you all a restful week of uh, academic leave if you happen to be taking it next week, because uh, it is one of the few times we can kind of take off when we don't have classes. And I'd just like to thank you, Donna, again for presenting. And Donna, we'd love to have you back uh, later on in the year when you have to finalize your results here. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate this opportunity. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Really appreciate the turnout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.